Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Neil Donnelly, and I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Today's session uh, is drugs, alcohol and mental health, and we have three excellent speakers. Our first speaker is Don Weatherburn from the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, and he's talking about the evaluation of the Merit Program. Jeez, Neil, that was brief. You sure you don't want to say something else about me, like I worked with you for 25 years or something like that? Anyway, uh, I've got to work this gadget out. I'll just do a practice run here. It's not changing. Green button, I'm red, green, colour blind. The big one. The big one. Nah. This is the story of my life. Do I have to face this thing to do? Help! <laughs> I press the big green one. Oh, we're off. What is merit? Always a good place to start. Um, merit. Oh, this is going to be bad. Uh, if you forgive me for looking at my feet, it's because the slides are here and I can't actually see. So merit is a pre-plea. Before I go any further, I just want to say it is very sad that Anna Stewart couldn't be with us. Those of you who know Anna Stewart would know that she helped put this conference on the road and I wouldn't want to start without acknowledging that. So merit's a pre-plea alcohol and other drug treatment program for defendants in the local court. Uh, the aim of the program is to reduce the harms associated with alcohol and other drug use and improve the health and well-being of defendants and reduce their offending. And if that sounds like it came out of a government report, it did. I didn't want to get it wrong. Uh, it takes about three months and uh, the treatment options include the full spectrum of options for people who've got drug and alcohol treatment problems, detoxification, pharmacotherapy, particularly for opioid problems. Oh, thanks. That's good. Okay. No, oh, <laughs> where are you going to take me? That's good. Uh, resi residential rehab, counselling, case management and welfare support. At the end of the treatment program, or at the point where the person's removed from the program, the merit team, and there's a merit team, I think, for most local courts, uh, put in a report to the court and the court takes the progress of the defendant into account when they're deciding what sentence to impose. Okay, so the next slide... No. Now I'm going back. As you can see, I've always had problems with this stuff. There we are. How does it work? This is going to be one of those really bad presentations. Referrals can be made by the defendant, the, the uh, lawyer or the magistrate or the police officer, although I understand that that's pretty rare. Uh, the relevant merit court team, and there is a merit court team, I think, for most uh, local courts, assess the defendant in terms of their risk to themselves or to others, and also in terms of their alcohol and drug use. If the team recommends the defendant is suitable uh, for the program, the magistrate agree, if the magistrate agrees, the person's placed on the program. If the defendant uh, is unsuitable for treatment, um, and that may be because there isn't a treatment available for their particular problem, or alternatively, and this is more common, the magistrate opposes placement on the merit program, the case proceeds as a normal prosecution. You can see there's quite a difference here between the way merit operates and the way in which the drug court operates. There's certainly an element of coercion involved, but you don't have a situation where the person is reporting uh, every two, twice a week and so on uh, on pain of going to jail if they fail. There's more information about that and that website that I've got there if you're interested in the merit program. Who's eligible? Well, you have to be an adult. You have to be released on bail. Although I actually noticed that quite a few of the people who, at least at some stage, weren't on bail got into the program. You have to have a demonstrable and treatable drug problem. You have to reside where you can participate in the program. And you can't be charged with an indictable offence, uh, a, a sexual assault offence or a serious violence and you have to provide written and informed consent. Now, there have been a number of other evaluations over time, and I'll just go quickly through these because it lays a bit of a foundation for the study that I'm going to be reporting to you. 
Uh, the first one was conducted by Passy et al. And their main finding was that there were lower rates of offending amongst program completers than non-completers. And I'll have something to say about that kind of comparison in a second. In the same year, the New South Wales Health Department, as it then was, conducted uh, a cohort analysis of people actually progressing through the merit program and found that there was clear indication of improvements in health as they went through the program. Uh, the next one was by Rowan Lullum when he was at the Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research. His was perhaps the most uh, rigorous of the approaches that had been adopted up to that point. He used uh, a method I'll come to in a minute, but basically found, uh, tried to deal more seriously with selection bias problems. Uh, he found no effect on an intention to treat basis, that is to say where everybody who gets referred to treatment is compared with everybody in the uh, comparison group. Uh, and the last one was by McSweeney, and as so often happens in criminological studies, it worked out people who were getting treatment were more likely to reoffend. I hope you're all disappointed by that finding. Because there are a number of problems with these. The PASI study compared completers with non-completers, which is an appalling practice and really should stop. The obvious problem with it is that people who are more highly motivated are more likely to complete their program and it may be that higher motivation that's responsible for the happy outcome rather than the treatment per se. There is one method for dealing with that problem I won't go into. The New South Wales Health Study was interesting. I mean, it was very reassuring to see that there was an improvement in health as people passed through the program, but it didn't have a comparison group. So there's no way of knowing whether or not those improvements would have happened anyway. Uh, Rowan Lullum used a technique called bivariate probate, and since I think most of you are policymakers, I'm not going to explain what a bivariate probate is. I will say one thing, in other words, when you do this particular kind of analysis, you need at least one what's called exogenous variable, one variable which influences access to treatment, but which has no effect, no direct effect on the outcome. And his instrument was legal representation. And there's no doubt at all there's a close relationship between getting legal representation and getting on merit but it's open to question that having legal representation has no bearing on the outcome. So there was a bit of a problem there. And the last study, McSweeney, didn't actually include any drug or alcohol use in the control for treatment selection, which is a pity because, you know, that's obviously central to the selection of people for the, for the program itself. They also had rather limited controls for reoffending. Number of concurrent offences is a classic. It's uh, strongly related to the likelihood of reoffending. And so too is whether or not a person's been in prison before. Well, after beating up all those other studies, I better tell you how good this one's going to be before I let you down later on. OK, so what's good about this evaluation? Well, first of all, it includes a much more extensive set of controls for substance abuse, which I'll explain shortly. Uh, secondly, it examines a broader range of outcomes. Today, I'm going to be talking about reoffending and imprisonment. Later on, we're hoping to have some reports to give you on the effect of the merit program on a person's health. It employs a more rigorous defence against selection bias, which I'll say a bit about shortly. It adjusts for any time spent in custody you know, when a person can't that easily reoffend, and it employs a much larger sample than previous studies have. Okay, what are the data sources? Well, it's my old alma mater, the Bureau, which came to the party with um, all the data that we needed to get the, st the study underway. They included everybody who appeared in a local court between 2008 and 2017 who had, be, who had uh, not been charged with a strictly indictable offence. Some of the people in the study have been charged with summary indictable offences, but that wouldn't rule them out. They had also not been charged with a sexual assault uh, or an offence involving serious violence, and they all, uh, none of them had been dismissed or had their cases dismissed on the grounds of men mental illness. Uh, these, were, these data I've just described were linked thanks to the New South Wales Health Department, or I think it's the New South Wales Ministry of Health these days. Sorry if I got that wrong. Um, they provided information of people in the merit database, which is extremely useful, but What's especially useful, and for the first time, is we were able to get information for both the treatment group and the comparison group from the admitted patients' data collection, all their data on alcohol and other drug uh, admissions, and the New South Wales Health Emergency Department data collection, again, all their data on alcohol and, and other drug use. So now, for the first time, we've got the potential for a strong bunch of controls. So what are our treatment and control groups? Well, the treatment group consists of all those who are eligible for merit, 
uh, and appeared in a merit court between 2007 and 2017, uh, who had an alcohol and other drug related admission previously, or an alcohol and other drug related um, emergency department admission. And there are 10,000 odd people in that group. Uh, the control group consists of the same uh, period cohort, that is to say everyone who turned up in a merit court between 2007 and 2017 and who had not been referred to a merit court but did have uh, an alcohol and other drug related admission, uh, emergency department admission or hospital admission and there are 391,000 people there. Okay, so what are our outcomes? Uh, is this too fast for everybody okay with this? Right. Not that you'd admit it if you thought it was too fast. Um, the first outcome is whether the defendant was convicted of committing another offence within 12 months uh, of um, the referral date to merit, the treatment group, and the sentence date if it was the control group. The second outcome is uh, whether or not the person ended up at the end of that process getting a prison sentence. The controls, uh, the usual controls for someone who's reoffending you're interested in looking at, they included Indigenous status, probably easier turning around this way, Indigenous status offence type, concurrent offences, number of prior convictions, and whether they'd been imprisoned in the previous five years. But we also included a number of offences which are relevant to consideration as to whether you'll get into the uh, drug into the merit program after chatting to the chief magistrate about that. And uh, they included whether you'd been convicted of a drug trafficking offence, whether you're convicted of assault, whether this is not just a serious assault, this is any assault, uh, whether you'd been convicted of an indictable offence, whether you had an OTP, that's an opioid uh, treatment plan episode in the preceding five years, whether you'd uh, appeared in the MDS data set, that's essentially a data set of people who've received treatment for drug or alcohol use. Uh, so there's a fairly strong set of controls there. Okay, the analysis, we, for the, any economists in the audience? Not one? Oh, there's one. Well, <laughs> we originally, I'm not going to labour this point, but I just want, for people who care about these things, I just want you to know we set off trying very hard, Sarah and I, uh, to run a residualised IV analysis. The virtue of that kind of analysis is that it deals with uh, selection bias, bias, not only the bias that arises from uh, controls that aren't adequate for your study, but also things you just simply fail to measure. But the assumption underpinning that mode of analysis is that the... Um, instrument that you're using. You remember I mentioned earlier about Rowan Lullum using legal representation. Well, the instrument's meant to be random, conditional on uh, court and time fixed effects, and we weren't able to satisfy ourselves that that was true. So we resorted to what's known as inverse, uh, augmented inverse probability of treatment weighting, and I, I can see you'll all breathe a sigh of relief that I'm not even going to bother trying to explain what that is. It's essentially, though, just a method for matching cases. You want the treatment group and the control group to be identical in all respects, or at least all the ones you can measure, save for the fact that the treatment group got treatment. Okay, so the general approach was to run a series of cross tabs to identify correlates of treatment or correlates of prison or correlates of reoffending. Uh, we then picked the ones that were significantly related and put them in a series of regression analyses, logistic regression to identify those that were independently predictive of the outcome of interest, and we then included those in the AIPW analysis. After that, we checked the covariate balance and propensity score matching. And that might sound boring, but it's going to turn out really important for the study that I'm talking about. So moving right along, uh, there's the sample description. I'm putting it up. Don't get bother reading through the numbers. The point is that every variable value is well represented. Um, so we don't have any problems with shortage of data on any of the variables. There is one point I'll make, though. We don't have. Um, Indigenous status identified for more than a quarter of the respondents. And because of that, and because only one person who had an unknown Indigenous status ended up in the treatment group, we had to remove all of the cases that involved uh, someone who was Indigenous, which is unfortunate. This is not some calumny on the part of the state government. It turns out that when you get charged with a driving offence, you're not likely to be asked what your Indigenous status is. Okay, so just uh, let's have a look at, oh, I'll go back now, I'll go back. Yeah, uh, this is a bit of a letdown for you. So before we adjust for any of the controls that I went through, 
Uh, straight off the bat, you can see that the treatment group's more likely to reoffend. 39% of those uh, reoffended within 12 months of getting treatment, whereas only 26.94, 27% of those in the control group reoffended. As you'd expect with that kind of pattern, uh, the treatment group were also more likely to end up in jail. About 10.5% of them uh, ended up in custody uh, in the treatment group compared with 6% odd in the other group. That's not a cause for alarm, that's just a sign that the, the merit program is drawing in people with a significant criminal history uh, and who are thought likely to reoffend. Okay, so this is, I'm just going to show you the bivariate relationships with uh, reoffending and with imprisonment. And I'll go, by, by, I use that phrase bivariate, that might be lost on some people. I'm just going to take each variable one at a time and look at its relationship with reoffending and then go through them all one at a time and look at their effect with prison. So you can see that uh, the yellow ones really are the giveaway there. More likely to reoffend if you're male, if you're indigenous, if you're 18 to 24 if you live in an outer remote, regional, remote or very remote area, or if illicit drugs are a primary offence, five minutes to go, you've got to be kidding. Mm. Well, do you want me to cut to the chase? All right. There's the chase. But I've got... Um, that's an odds ratio graph. If you're above the horizontal line, that means that you're more likely to reoffend, controlling for all the other factors along the bottom. If you're below that horizontal line, you're less likely to reoffend, and you'll see joy for joy down the far end there. If you're in treatment, you're less likely to reoffend, or so it would seem. This is the situation for prison. I, I can't even explain it, I'm running out of time here, but if you look on the far right, you'll see that the odds ratio is below one, which is an indication that you're less likely to end up with a prison sentence. Don't worry about the wings on the dots, they're just confidence intervals. So it's looking good. I'm tearing through it now. Of course, the problem with regression analysis is there's no guarantee when you run a regression that the treatment and control groups are identical. So we run the AIPW. 36, 37% of those who didn't get treatment uh, re-offended. And you see that minus 0 0.046, that's 4.6 percentage points lower than the, the uh, control group. So that's a good result. If you look across at the P greater than Z, you'll see it's statistically significant. Everything looks terrific. Same thing for prison. You can see that about 6.7% of the control group went to prison uh, and the treatment group 1.3 percentage points lower, less likely to go to prison, and the result is statistically significant. And I'd really, really, really like to stop the presentation here, but there's bad news. You remember I said that we want to get the, well, two things. We really need the probability of being in the treatment group to be able to, we needed to have that overlapping with the probability of being the treat group if you're in the control group. Well, there is overlap, but it's perilously close to one, which is for reasons I won't go into because I don't have enough time, is a bad thing. But this next slide will tell you something which you do understand. If you just concentrate on the weighted column, the standardized difference weighted column, we want those values to be, we want the weighted difference between the treatment and control group to be close to zero for all these controls we've got here. And they're mostly low, but you can see the ones I've highlighted show you that they are not all low. There's a problem with covariate balance for those who've got more than four, uh, four or more convictions, those who've got prior imprisonment, and those who've had an MDS episode in the last five years. And on the right-hand side, in the weighted column there, we want those ratios to be near as one. We want the variance of the two groups to be as close to one as we can get it. And you can see with prior imprisonment, OT OTP episode and OTP um, of the f first court appearance, they're imbalanced. The treatment and control groups, to put it bluntly, are different in respects other than just treatment. I've got two minutes, I'll get there. Don't you worry about that. Okay, so what's the... You didn't expect that slide, Neil. Uh, so treatment does appear to reduce uh, uh, reoffending and imprisonment, but the lack of covariate balance simply means we can't trust that conclusion. There are issues to resolve. Uh, what really does, um, what really drives treatment every entry? We're having a lot of trouble finding out exactly what covariate pattern best predicts treatment entry. It's possible that treatment affects some subgroups better than others. It's possible, for example, that those who've got a heroin problem and are on methadone maintenance treatment or buprenorphine are doing better than the rest. Uh, it's possible that some treatment teams do better than others. So we need to explore that. So the key policy implication is zero. Don't take 
this story home and say you've discovered an effective program. This is a work in progress. You know, I wanted to tell you it was a great success, but I can't. And the key take home message is talk to the evaluator before you introduce a program. You really shouldn't have to go through all of this. It should be quite easy to do the evaluation without this jiggery pokery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. That leaves seven minutes for questions. Oh, you want me to come back up? Yep. <laughs> right. I'm just dismantling myself. Any questions? Well, they took the hint. Oh, this one over here. <laughs> here we go. Yes, please wait for the microphone. I've been instructed to say that. <laughs> Thanks, Don, for the great presentation. Um, I just have a question. So on this really impressive analysis, how many analysts did you have working on this and how long did it take in total? Well, it was me and Sarah. But before, <laughs> but before that, uh, I have to give credit to New South Wales Health because they actually stitched the data set together. Uh, then Sarah weaved to uh, start a magic on creating variables that I would never have been able to create with that data set. Uh, then I did the analysis with Sarah offering advice from the sidelines and helping me out. Um, how long did it take? Oh, God. Hard to say. I kept coming back to it, hoping that things would get better. <laughs> uh, how long would you say, Sarah? A month? The, the linkage took a long time. Oh, if you're thinking of doing the study, mm, give yourself a year. Just to get the data together. Sorry? More. More. Sorry? Two years. Is that how long it took? Right. It's a wonder anyone does research. Anyway, any other questions? Up the yes. back. Yes, Don. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Are uh, we at the point, as you know, merit doesn't apply at all local court locations, and in particular the... Uh, the alcohol component of it doesn't work at a lot of locations. Are we in a position yet to go to government and say, in adjustment reinvestment sense, that we're saving you money by running these programs? Can't we roll it out across the whole state? I don't think we are, to be honest with you. I mean, unless the alternative is to lock people up. Um, but I think from my standpoint, none of the evaluations, including the one I've just presented, really settle the issue. Um, clearly, everybody would prefer to have people referred to treatment um, than prosecuted. But the $64,000 question is, is treatment reducing the likelihood of going to jail and reducing the likelihood of reoffending? And I think that question is still open. Any other questions? Uh, thanks, Don. I just uh, this is obviously a program that's long standing, and you're probably not going to get policymakers to make a change that would help the evaluation, and probably not going to convince too many people to roll out programs in the future that are randomised. So, what, in the absence of that, would you be advising policymakers when you say they should think about the evaluation in advance? Well, I don't think I've given you any reason for removing the program. It's not as if prima facie it looks like it makes things worse. So I'm not, I wouldn't want to be interpreted as suggesting that the program is a failure. Far from it. We're just in a state of agnosticism. As for randomised trials, they're a lot easier than you think. For example, when we did the drug court, we allowed the drug court team decided who was eligible for the program. Nobody interfered with that. But there were insufficient places for everybody who was eligible to get on the program. So they then randomised amongst those who were eligible and put them in the program. And long after the evaluation ceased, they're still randomising because they think it's the most equitable way of proceeding. Second point, if you can't bring yourself to do that kind of randomization, what would really help the evaluator is keeping a record of who was eligible for the program but didn't get on it and why. Because if the reason they didn't get on it was some benign thing like they're out of the area or, for example, the, I don't know, funds dried up in one of the locations or one of the courts, if there's some exogenous reason, external reason why the program had to limit the numbers, the people who can't get on but who are eligible are a perfect control group. So it's not as if you have to run an experiment. 
uh, to get a good evaluation going. Does that help? We still have time for a question in the middle there. Thanks very much for your presentation, Don. Uh, Alexia Lennon from Queensland Corrective Services. I'm wondering, has there been any intention to do any qualitative kind of follow-up on some of the stuff that you've done here? Because presumably, people who are accepted into the program are kept out of prison for at least the length of the program, and that might have positive impacts on their other parts of their lives. Yes, I have a colleague at uh, uh, NDOC, the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, who's conducting a qualitative evaluation of the merit program as we speak. Uh, and interviewing both the participants, um, the program managers, and other key personnel involved in the program. And I must emphasize the qualitative evaluation of these programs is really important. Some years ago, when we were doing the drug court evaluation, um, we found that the lawyers were rigging the arrest dates to get their favorite offenders on the program. That would never have come out of statistical analysis. That came out of the fact that, I think it was Karen Freeman, who's here somewhere, uh, who found that out. And so it's really important to combine the two. The usual problem, of course, is that it's cheaper to run quantitative evaluations than qualitative, um, but you really need to run both in partnership. And we have time for one more question. Okay, thank you very much, Don. Thanks, mate. Well,